Well, buenos dias. Thank you both for being here today. Would you mind stating your names up for the camera? Okay. Of course. Uh, my name is Juan Jose Gutierrez Rodriguez. I'm a Puerto Rican living in New York City for many, many years. Well, Puerto Rican all the time. And I would add a legend of the Bombang Plena tradition and a nas uh, National Endowment for the Arts Heritage Fellow. It's a pleasure to be uh, here with you today. And with uh, your daughter, uh, let's say a future legend, Julia, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Julia Loisa Gutierrez Rivera. Rivera must acknowledge my mother. Mm -hmm. Without her, of course, as echoing his statements, I would not be here. Um, again, like he said, I am Boricua, Puerto Rican, born and raised in New York, but still first and foremost, Boricua. All right, yeah, part of what a lot of folks are calling the Diaspora Rican community, yeah. right? Because Puerto Ricans are uh, on the island and all over the United States Every and really Rican. all over the world. <laughs> um, Guanga, if I may call you that, um, tell us a little bit about just your musical background, sort of growing up in Puerto Rico, your, the music that was around you, and, and your musical formation. <clears throat> First of all, uh, I'm really humbled by, uh, you know, just being here and uh, you saying that um, uh, I'm a heritage fellow and uh, it's really humbles me. Playing, you know, like uh, something that is, I said, wow, it hits me really, really deep. But uh, going to your question, um, I felt music since I remember. And um, I think my father, because he was a, a music lover person, he had records all the time. He used to go to, to uh, parties with my, with, uh, with my mother, and he'd take, uh, you know, he'd, he would take us, and uh, there was live band all the time. Uh, I remember sitting next to a bandstand uh, watching and listening the, to the music and the musicians, not only the music, but what was happening in the bandstand among the musicians, you know, those dynamics. And I love it, and I love it. And uh, uh, then I had the opportunity at uh, in primary school uh, to apply for uh, La Escuela Libre de Musica, the Pew Music School, that, uh, that was a, a citywide uh, project that uh, uh, called for students to, to take a, a, a test in a, you know, music appreciation. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get in and that was uh, a, a life-changing experience uh, since the early age because it was a citywide thing. Uh, there were kids from all over uh, the, me the, me the metropolitan area of Puerto Rico. It wasn't only a neighborhood, but all over. And that was something really uh, exciting, powerful, very deep, meaningful. Yes. And you grew up in San Jose, right? Uh -huh. And isn't that sort of a, a neighborhood that's really well known for a, sort of like a cradle of musicians in, uh, in Puerto Rico? Indeed, indeed. I mean, I was born in San Jose, but I was raised uh, in a, one of the suburbs of, of San Juan, which is Caparra. And, and I've heard you talk about the plena being in the background growing up. Yes, yes, indeed, because Plena has always been a, a, by my, in those days, it was present. Not only, you know, in the barrios, if you're not from the barrio, you weren't able to, to watch the Pleneros, but if you go to the ballpark, there were Pleneros playing there, but also the musicians, the working musicians, they always had a repertoire. You know, it's not like that now. But if they had the repertoire, they could play a, a paso doble, they could play the, a foxtrot, but they also had the la plena y la bomba in the repertoire for people to dance right there, you know. So it was and not only there, but also in the radio. It was promoted in the radio, it was all over. And then there was Cortijo, Amor Rivera, and you know, and those are, you know, our heroes, our influences. When you were going to music school, what kind of, where do you, was uh, uh, bomba and plena and other tr traditional Puerto Rican genres part of the repertoire? All over, because not, not, not only um, the, uh, the teachers that we had, they were working musicians, the best working musicians, because they, these guys, these teachers, they perhaps they didn't have, they didn't go to college to get their, 
education degree, but they were, they had the life experience because they were working in the circuit of the hotel circuit, you know, and uh, the clubs and the recording, they were the best musicians in Puerto Rico. And they were teaching us. And who, so what are some of those names oh, that, that you, we, we should be remembering? In our oh, country? Rafael Gonzalez Peña, that, that's one of my, my gods, mm -hmm. because, I mean, he could play any instrument. He would, he would tell you, he would show you, this is how it is, this is how it does, this is how it's supposed to sound. And then not only that, he, in those days, he could write, I mean, for, for a band, you could, you could see, I watch him on his desk writing the music with, uh, como se llama, con el tintero la? Uh, Inkwell. Oh, yes. Writing, and that was like a, something really, really great. And uh, I mean, he was being one of the greatest, uh, not only musicians, but educators. Uh, very, uh, he, uh, he was part of one of the greatest orga uh, musical organizations, Orquesta de Rafael Muñoz. And from there on, then, there were other generations of musicians while I was staying at uh, Escuela Libre de Musica. Uh, there was a, a um, guy that uh, we call it Julio, because it, that's what he said, uh, I am Mr. Julio Martinez. I was a trumpet player with the La Orquesta Panamericana. In those days, I mean, Okay, could you imagine uh, a teacher inviting students in his car to go to the radio station to play live at the radio station with Orquesta Panamericana? So, so you ultimately go to uh, Puerto Rico. I mean, you ultimately move to New York, and when you move to New York, you have a very strong foundation, not just in music, but in Puerto Rican music no and Afro Caribbean it. music. No question. Tell us a little bit about that move to New York, and you sort of. Uh, becoming a professional musician there. Yes, indeed, because we uh, we had all those this all this colorful experiences in Puerto Rico, not only playing uh, all kinds of musical uh, genres and uh, uh, atmospheres, everything. Uh, not only that, from uh, then La Escuela Libre de Música, I went to the Conservatory of Music. I went to the uh, University of Puerto Rico, then the Conservatory of Music at the same time. And then I, I had the opportunity to, to play the symphony the uh, Philhar Philharmonic Opera, marching bands, you name it, Where I were you played. you playing? It sounds like you were playing a million instruments. Yes, and then uh, I had the opportunity to also record and uh, play big concerts to, the, uh, to Danny Rivera, Lucecita. These were great names, uh, great singers of Puerto Rico, they still around. So I had that really uh, big experience at a young age. So uh, then I, I decided that I had to go on and uh, moved to New York, I married, and then we left, and uh, um, I applied, and I sent an audition in tape to Manhattan School of Music. And uh, directly to the, uh, to the teacher, uh, the teacher's name is Fred Hinger. He was the timpani player for the Met, Metropolitan Orchestra before he spent many years with the Philadelphia Orchestra, and he was a legend. So he had, he had developed this technique and, and timpani playing and all that. He made his own drums, he had a company, all that, and uh, he listened to a tape, and uh, he told me, come and uh, play in front of us, but the tape is great, so. What, what year was that? That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> 1976. Yeah, I was, was going to guess uh, sometime in the mid late 70s. <laughs> so you're a Boricua living in New York, successful yes. musician, playing lots of gigs, yeah. and you feel this calling, right? Um, yeah, what happened was that, uh, uh, I mean, when you go on to school, it was like uh, studying all the time, practicing all the time, like eight hours, 10 hours, and then attending to, you know, uh, I mean, my wife, we just were recently married. Uh, then the money situation was tight, and then I had a friend who already had, you know, uh, a nice gig playing with uh, Patti LaBelle. And then he, uh, he called me and he said, listen, I'm going, I don't, I don't know, you probably remember Peter Allen. 
he said, well, I'm going to go with Peter Allen on tour. Uh, and I'm doing right now, I'm doing a show, an off-Broadway show. They are doing a tour. Would you like to, uh, to come in and take my chair? He said, of course, because, I mean, then uh, we were having, a, my wife was expecting our first child. So it was the right opportunity for me. So I started playing. Uh, the uh, Binet Carol's Your Arms Too Short to Box with God. And it was a gospel uh, show that we're touring the uh, United States. That's where I uh, met uh, Patti LaBelle. But before Patti LaBelle, it was, uh, I'll tell you in a minute later, uh, she became very famous with Dream Girls, the lead singer. Anyway, and then uh, it was a great experience. I stayed there for five years. In the meantime, I already had the need of saying, well, I am pursuing excellence in music. That's what I want to do. But I feel that I need to, uh, you know, get a, the, the, the strong footing in my music because I cannot aspire for any excellence if I'm not, you know, if I don't know my roots the way I want to know them. And I, you know, I was uh, perhaps in New York was the right place. In between uh, tours, uh, I used to play with uh, Pepe Castillo. He's a great, great uh, musician and folk singer. And uh, my, some of my buddies were playing there. And they invited me over to play. And they were playing Puerto Rican music. And uh, that's how I knew about I learned about Marcia Reyes. Marcia Reyes, perhaps, besides the National Heritage Fellows, perhaps he's uh, responsible for me being here. So you met him uh, in this group of Puerto Rican musicians? Not really. I learned about him. I said, okay. well, he was a legend. Yeah. Uh, Marcia used to live in New York, and he was part of this legendary group of pleneros called Los Pleneros de la 110. Victor Montañez y Los Pleneros de la 110. And uh, so uh, Marcial by that time was, uh, was back in Puerto Rico after many years of uh, living in New York, but he was uh, coming every summer. So uh, I heard that uh, the, uh, in one of the summers, I heard that uh, the, the Los Pleneros de la 110 was going to play at the La Fiesta de Santiago Apostol, okay? And then uh, I went there with my wife and the kids. He wasn't there yet. And uh, Marcia was the kind of, he was a character. He was the kind of guy before going on stage, he used to do playing out with the people. Mm -hmm. He was right there playing. I said, wow, this is something different. And then I went there after he, Finish before going on stage. Said, Marcia, it's an honor to meet you. Uh, I'd like to, perhaps, maybe if I can call you. He said, Come and get me tomorrow. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> this is my number. Come and get me. I live here. So I went there. I took him home. Uh, my wife cooked a nice meal, but we spent the whole day just playing the music. And I put that big box with the cassette, and he thought it was a radio interview. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Marcia Reyes Isabel. I'm here with my great friend Juan Gutierrez, and we're gonna do some plena school like this, and this is the history of La Plena. It was like, a, like an interview. You go, wow, that's something. So we spent many countless hours doing that. And while I was taking him back, he said, stop there by the bodega, Let's get a couple of beers and play something. You have no money? Don't worry about it. Let's play. And people will start pouring money, you know, for the beer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that went on, you know, many hangouts. Then I, every time I, I got home, my wife said, you know, I was saying, wow, Lucy, that's something. That was great. And uh, my wife said, uh-huh. Yes, great. But let me tell you something. You better do something with Marcia, put a group together, 
or do something else. <laughs> and uh, she was also responsible for the me. The ultimatum. Mm -hmm. So this is, takes us to like 1983, I guess, when Los Plenero de la 21 are born. Yes, yes, indeed. But uh, in between, uh, let's say, 77, 79, and 83, there were those hangouts with Marcial. <laughs> he would go back to Puerto Rico, come back in the summer, and spend the whole summer. Yeah. So, so by the time 83 rolls around and you form Los Plena de la 21, what is the status of Plena in, the, in, like, in New York? Is there, are people hearing a lot of it? Is it kind of like old-timey music? Is it, does it seem relevant to folks there? Uh, but in those days, basically, uh, you heard La Plena if you go to, for example, to social clubs mm -hmm. where you know, people just hang out, the old-timers, you know. I didn't, I never saw young people like me, you know, in those days playing, except for you know, a few exceptions. Uh, but basically, uh, elders playing the music, no bomba. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, with also a few exceptions when uh, you go in the summer, they had community festivals, uh, the Festival de, de Luis Aldea de los Hermanos Fraternos in East Harlem or in Randall Island, and you will see a folkloric groups that were put together uh, for that particular occasion, and they would do bomba, you know. And then, but this guy uh, that, I, uh, that I mentioned before, Los Pleneros de la Cinto, Victor Montañez, he was a foremost plenero, but he was a bombero. And I approached him uh, for, you know, talk to him and, and about La Bomba. And I, used, I had the opportunity to, to sit down with him and play because Marcial had said, no, no Bomba, Bomba is, that's past, that's all people. Plena is the one now, you know, but he was a Bombero also. But what was that process like for you to go, because you had to do a, a lot of investigating to really sort of learn more about Bomba and learn about the kind of intricacies and. Uh, the diversity of, the, of those rhythms. Can you talk a little bit about that process of, of finding out these elders, uh, these uh, these older practitioners, and what they taught you? Of course, of, of like course. Musical values. Well, it was all martial, because uh, by the time I, oh, the story's not doesn't finish there. With Lucy, they said you better do something with myself. I went next day. I said martial, let, let's put a group together. When well, mijo, uh, I was waiting for you to to say something like that, but it's you, because I've done what I've done, now it's your turn. But then he said, well, let's go get this guy. Let's go get that guy. I didn't know them. And then I went on, and we, uh, we used to go to his, uh, to his home in the South Bronx. And then we, uh, we met uh, Iyane, he, uh, Benjamin Flores, the Flores brothers, and his cousin, uh, Paquito Rivera. And uh, so we just hang out and played at La Reconcrio La Casita, that's 158th and Brook Avenue over there. I uh, just hang out and play, but Marcial was the, the anchor for that, you know. In those days, uh, they didn't have even a phone, so every time I, I had to go and talk to them, I had to go over there. If they were not there, I had to look around in the neighborhood to find them. So, but that's how it happened. Then Marcial, when the group uh, was already cohesive, and he had to go back to Puerto Rico, he told me, well, you need a singer. Let's go to uh, 115th and Madison. We went to this social club, and uh, the guy who owned the social club, that was uh, Pablo Ortiz. They call him Gallito. He was a, a great plena singer, a great plenero. And that we, when they are just hang out, and we started playing, started singing. And then I approached him, and I said, uh, talked to him. He said, "Listen, I'm going back to uh, Puerto Rico, and they are uh, have this." Excellent group, this, 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 this guys over there, you want to be part? Well, yeah, why not? Let's do it. So that's how we started. Then also with uh, one of our, my peers, uh, 
Tito Cepeda was a young guy who learned with also with Marcial, and then I met him uh, while I was putting out uh, things with Pepe Castillo. And then, of course, Edgardo Miranda, guitar player, who was also playing with Pepe, and I uh, had known Edgardo since we, uh, we were kids, playing rock and roll. So that's how it happened. Now, uh, when, even though you're the founder of the group, you talk about you were like really one of the youngest people within the scene. You're really mostly surrounded by older musicians. Yes. Now your group is in the midst of a generational shift. Um, we've got a whole lot of young pleneros and bomberos in the group. And maybe, uh, Julia, you can kind of comment a little bit about like, why is this music um, still speaking to uh, young boricuas? Mm -hmm. What's this, um, like, why is this music relevant, you think? Uh, the music, a lot of people tend to hear Boma and Plena as music of our ancestors, of our roots and our traditions, but it, it's music that captures experiences, and experiences have no deadline. It's something that is lived every day. Um, it just captures it in a way that's very um, catchy and harmonious and percussive, so it's just, it kind of appeals to a lot of people, it doesn't matter necessarily you know, if you had ever been to Puerto Rico, if you even understand what the stories talk about, it's something that is really, um, it, it kind of captures a broad universal sense of just being human, right? Mm -hmm. Experiences that people go through every day. Um, in terms of the relevance of, of young generations um, with the Pleneros, we've also always, and I, I'm speaking on his behalf now, um, always considered the ensemble to be a family type of ensemble. Um, you know, not just between blood, but just the, the ties and the relationships that and the bonds that happen amongst the musicians. Um, and so, yes, when the group first started, Juan and Juan and, and Tito were the youngest members. Um, and moving forward, you know, 30 plus years down the line, he's now the oldest. Um, but we, we still have this, this intergenerational feel going on. And I think that that's part of not only the mission of Los Preneros as a nonprofit organization, as an ensemble, but also the mission of the genres in and of itself. You need to be able to pass it forward to somebody else. You need to be able to allow people to express and invent themselves within the traditions because that's how the traditions thrive. That's how they grow. That's how they stay relevant. You know, that's how we give them life and air. Um, so with us now, with this current iteration of Los Teneros, we have, yes, about two or three different generations on the stage together. The youngest member now is 23 years old, who's younger than how, how old Juanga was when the group started. Um, but even with that, it's a little bit more complex because we have different experiences and um, years in the traditions of that don't necessarily relate to our biological age, meaning um, I'm part of, I guess, the younger part of the Los Pleneros, but I was born and raised in this. So yes, I am still a baby when it comes to living in these traditions, but I, I have seen the elders. I have been part of that experience. As with Camilo Molina Gaetan and Nelson Mateo Gonzalez and several of the, of the ensemble members who are my, my colleagues, they're all between you know 25, 34 years old, we were born and raised in these traditions. We're carrying it on because it was part of the mission of our parents, our grandparents. But we're also working with musicians that are not raised in these traditions. Um, and they're young, but they have, similar to the experience of Juango, have a calling uh, as Puerto Ricans in the diaspora to be able to um, use their talent and connect it to their cultural heritage. So they're young both in age and also within their experience in, this, in these traditions. So it's a very interesting moment, I think, in, in the ensemble's history. Do you think, you talk a little bit about sort of connecting music to resilience mm -hmm. and the kind of Boricua spirit of resilience, just given, well, you know, 100 years of history of, uh, in diaspora and going back and forth to the island and severe economic challenges, especially in this particular moment. <laughs> you talk a little bit about uh, the sort of um, uh, the, the membership of Los Pereros and how it's sort of really bringing together uh, Puerto Ricans from that are raised in New York or the United States, like your case, folks from the island, folks that are sort of more recent uh, immigrants, 
Uh, talk a little bit about the sort of how uh, the group membership is reflecting sort of what's happening uh, with, with Puerto Ricans at the moment. Well, it would not really be fair for me to continue to address that uh, before I round up the one thing yeah. that Please. we were talking about before is about Eugenia Ramos. Mm. Uh, she was also a part of that original ensemble. And uh, because of my insistence of doing also Bomba, and then we have the Flores brothers, uh, they were uh, the children of a, one of the foremost Bomba dancers of Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, and uh, he, not only, and uh, their grandpa, their grandfather was like uh, one of the greatest ever <clears throat> practitioners of bomba in the early days mm -hmm. of Puerto Rico, Eustacio Flores. And then we're talking about Bobo Flores, who was the father of the Flores brothers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a great opportunity. Uh, it was a blessing to have them there. And uh, so we had to do bomba. And Marcial, who, First, uh, tried to deviate me from Bomba. He was the f the very first uh, guy who made a drum for Los Planeros. Our first drum, he made it. So then uh, we had the Flores brothers and his cousin Paquito, and uh, they were able to uh, to make drums from things that they found, all barrels in the in the backyards or whatever, and we still use some. So, uh, but Eugenia, the, uh, Eugenia was part of uh, an older ensemble, but she's like uh, the matriarch mm -hmm. of, um, because she comes from a family of dancers and storytellers and musicians from all San Juan. And uh, she's one of the greatest dancers that you ever seen, you know, and uh, I pursue her all the time. I buy her, she was, no. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, and how do, uh, when do you rehearse? <laughs> well, she was great. And uh, finally, we had him in the group. Um, it was something. And p perhaps, uh, Julia, I know she, she was part of that uh, experience because uh, Julia was like a model, not only for, for them, but for all of us. And he brought a, a lot of old songs you know, for, to the repertoire, but I had to say that. Uh, about your question, uh, what was your question? <laughs> uh, um, the membership of the group, so originally it started off really as a kind of, I think more to serve like uh, New York's Puerto Rican community, but now really you have membership from- Of course, well, know. start to make a, a long story short, which I am so <laughs> with that. So, uh, in, the, in those days, I was really uh, concerned because the elders, as I was sooner or later, they're gone. What was gonna happen? But it was something magical because we were doing that. And then it's like a, a magnet or a sponge for all the practitioners to come and check, check us out. And that's how it happened. All of a sudden, we have Jose Rivera, which is uh, my, my generation, uh, also a great plenero, a singer and drum maker, and his father was one of the greatest singers of La Plena in Puerto Rico, and so on. We had all the, all the guys, all the practitioners who, who knew about, who know about the music, who know how to make the music, play the music, and that's how it happened. Then, as years went by, we started that relationship with our other musicians in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican musicians, younger. We had the opportunity to go over there in 1980, no, 1993. Mm -hmm. Our first trip to Puerto Rico. Uh, it's called Dos Alas, Two Wings. And uh, uh, we were a sensation among the uh, community of bomberos and planeros, everyone came to check us out. From uh, Rafael Cepeda, who also a National Heritage Fellow, now one of his children, Modesto, uh, and that's great. So, uh, 
they came to check us out because Roberto, one of his children, was a part of the group at that time. And that we had to mention that also, that Roberto, coming just off the army, moved to New York, he went to see Los Planeros, and he came dancing. I said, wow, this guy is something else. And then we took him over, and he, he joined the group. And that he was also a big, big influence in what we were doing. So, uh, and the composition of Los Planeros, basically that foundation had to do with not only the partitions, but uh, working musicians, uh, veteran working musicians who knew about how to play, how to, you know, to uh, the performance practice of La Plena and La Bomba, aside from the drumming aspect, we're talking about strings, we're talking about uh, keyboards. How do you, you know, how do you play this music? We call it an easy, difficult thing, un fácil, difícil. Okay? Because it's so simple that it's difficult. It's not song, it's not guaracha, it's plena. And you get from here, you get from there, and it's all bomba also. So these guys who used to play, uh, and they basically are part of uh, the musicians who, who wrote the book about performance practice of this kind of music. So. We had that foundation, the practitioners and professional musicians joining together. It wasn't easy, but we have a lot, you know, we learn from each other, and that's the foundation. That, that's how we keep the foundation today. Uh, it's very important. Then we bring musicians that over the years, they're young musicians, excellent musicians, very talented, but they also have that sense of commitment, which is, uh, a very important element. It has, a, it has to be a requisite because there are many talented, uh, skillful musicians, young, but if they don't have that, that sense of commitment, then it doesn't work. Well, and, and your organization is obviously that represents the height of musical excellence within these traditions, but you're more than a musical group. You are a 501c3, you have a social mission. Um, and could you talk a little bit about the sort of uh, that social impulse, that calling that you said, music is something that can help our community. Can you talk a little bit about why and, and what you do with uh, the, the Puerto Rican and, and just broader uh, community in New York City? Of course, well, since uh, performing in community events and doing things, uh, we got acquainted with the community of uh, of uh, other leaders in the uh, cultural organizations in New York, and also other scholars and people who are who brought influence into this uh, circuit. Uh, let, I need to mention Rene Flores. Uh, probably some of the guys here in the Smithsonian they know about Rene Flores. Ah, uh, Rene Lopez. I'm sorry. He was the one responsible for us to uh, uh, have a contact with James Early, and uh, we received the very first invitation to come to the Smithsonian to perform for the Martin Luther King's celebration in January. That was 88, I think. And from there, since we performed there, the, all the, oh, Haney, all the guys were there, I got up, it was great. And uh, we had an invitation to go to the USSR. Uh, a contingent of, uh, of traditions of uh, musical and life traditions, community traditions in the United States, uh, put together by Ralph Prinsler, you know, and that was superb. That was the first uh, thing, and uh, because of that, because of that, I mean, we thought that to give continuance to we were, what we were doing and expand and do other things, worship classes. Uh, I started talking uh, 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 with these uh, peers and leaders in the community uh, field and the cultural field and said, well, maybe you, you want to apply for, you know, for 501c3, but first you got to go to charitable organizations and all that, and it was a, a process, but finally we did, finally we did, and uh, that's how we started uh, evolving and doing things that all brings 
uh, and uh, feeds the tradition and also it's important to have that presence in the community because without the community it doesn't happen that's why in everything we do we have to touch them you know we're on stage it doesn't matter what happens we got to go there and touch them now, there was one very special year for your organization and for you, which was 1996, which is when the National Endowment for the Arts uh, awards you a National Heritage Fellowship. Can you tell us about the impact of that? What did that do for the group? Was it something that you were able to leverage to gain more recognition, more gigs? What, what was the impact? Okay. That's a good one. I've been thinking since the first uh, time you mentioned it. and. Uh, well, it's been very important to me, like privately. You know, I really didn't, wasn't that important to me for people to know about that. You know, it, it really said, well, I, I, I guess I'm doing something good. You know, uh, let's get better. And that's, that's what it is for me is something that elevates me in, in making a bigger effort, you know, in going deeper, and then trying to embrace more, more into this, you know, and uh, hopefully, you know, that, that would take place within my time, then, you know, next the next generation will, of course. And, and speak, talking about taking the baton, uh, where do you see uh, Plena and Bomba going in the next few years in terms of, not necessarily changing musically, but in terms of its relationships to its audiences? That's a good one. Um, I mean, in, in alignment with the Plenero's point of view, because there's multiple ensembles and multiple practitioners that portray and approach this music in various different ways. But with the Plenero's, as an ensemble and as a nonprofit, the driving force and the driving thought has always been this is something that's much more bigger than any individual, right? Which is why we give classes, which is why we try to create spaces for, for people to come and enjoy the music because that's how communities create it, right? That's how, that's how we thrive. Um, and with that being said, when we, when we transfer that to the stage, we are very much a performing ensemble. But it's not theater, what you're seeing. You know, we, we thrive off of the energy that the people in the audience give us. And we try as much as possible to engage with them, right? So it's, it's, it's very much a, a dialogue that we try to always have, you know, as performers and with audiences. And I think that if we continue moving forward with those driving forces, there really is no ceiling for this music because it's a human experience. And so that's, that's our push, that's the motivation for us to just continue trying to obviously um, make sure that there's a permanence of this music within the Puerto Rican and Latino community. But this isn't just Puerto Rican music, it's music, right? So it should go everywhere, it should continue to go everywhere. Um, you know, we just finished uh, recording a live album concert uh, a couple weeks ago. It's gonna drop in a, in a few months. And we're using that experience, you know, working with the new generation of musicians to go back into the studio. So, you know, in terms of our next steps and our grander vision, we just look, are looking forward to just continuing making music and doing it while we have the benefit of having him here, right? Because um, sometimes, you know, it's, people don't, have a chance to do that. Um, but it's, it's definitely a call for us to make sure for my colleagues that have had the experience of living with the elders to just continue that experience as much as possible. This will go on and will get stronger and farther with, uh, because I see, I, I only see this as a network. Uh, we contribute with what we know, what we can offer, and you, as a scholar, you bring what you can offer. What can you do to impact this? But then, about the music, it's very important that we have that, that uh, 
communication with uh, great musicians, musicians who know, uh, you know, because I believe in that, in that foundation, in how to play this music, uh, because once you know, then you can expand. It's not something that is premeditated. You, you mentioned fusion. It's not fusion. It's something, it's an influence. Uh, we talk about, let's say, a chef putting together, creating something. And he or she is meticulous putting these ingredients that, that complement the flavor and the aroma and everything. But it has to taste good to her or to him before offering to somebody else. And that somebody else is the people. And we cannot and may not forget the people because this is the people's expression. We will influence the people because we honestly believe that we are getting something from them and we are trying to supplement and enrich that with our experiences. But something that goes together that can amplify that sense and bring them back to them. That's so important. Let me ask you both a final question. All right, because let's assume that most of the folks listening to this interview aren't necessarily familiar with bull bang bang traditions. So let's pretend you're both on a desert island. You have two albums you can take, two recordings. I'd like Juanga to say, recommend for our listeners uh, an older Plena recording and a newer Plena al album that you think would be a good, either speak to you or would be good for a sort of newcomer to the genre to latch on to. And maybe you can tackle the uh, bomba genres. Hmm. An older and newer recording that you're like, look, if you want to get into this music, this mm -hmm. is where you should start. Mm -hmm. uh, I will um, refer to the most re recent happening. If you were able to record yesterday's, yes, you recorded <laughs> it. <laughs> Not the concert. The uh, the conversation oh, we had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The plan of thing that we did. Mm -hmm. That was the true thing. That mean that really that that's what it is. Not only because we were demonstrated, no, that's part of something. But what was happening, the dialogue that we had, and Victor, he just came up with something right there. He started thinking, came up with uh, this verse about La Ventiuna, about the people, right there. That's what it is, and uh, you have the essence. Then Ricardo with the with the horn with the clarinet, I mean it, it really elevated me, and I hope it did the same thing for Absolutely. the audience. But there's so many recordings. Um, go back to the roots, to the to the to the two masters, Cortijo, Imael, Mon Rivera, Rafael Cepeda, Felix Alduen. Go to them and listen. And when you finish listening, listen some more. <laughs> okay. Good tips. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and then from there you will find all the all the things. You know, that's that's the you start the path. Yeah. Your 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 you know, your path is right there to start. Then you will, as you go along, you will find all the things that really attract you. That yeah. has a proper foundation. Oh yes. How about you, Julia? That's a tough question, my goodness. <laughs> I'm trying to go through my iPod list and see what things I'm listening to the other day. What's on my favorites list? Um, uh, with Bomba, uh, hey, uh, definitely uh, the album of uh, Patriarca de la Bomba, por Rafael Cepeda. Um, that is, I think, an emblematic album of what Bomba Estilo Santurce was. You know, and it, it's just like hearing his voice and just hearing those drums is just so, it creates a visceral reaction, you know, for a lot of people. And I think that that, for, for being able to kind of explain what Bomba is, you need to have that kind of like feeling in your gut. And that album really does that, I think, for me. Um, if, we're, if we're thinking about something that's a little bit more recent, more contemporary, I, I would venture to say, um, an album by a group called Alma Moyo. Um, it's kind of like a home produced album. And the reason why I'm mentioning it is, is not necessarily for 
you know, what I mentioned about Rafael Cepeda, but it, it's what it captures. It's a group of bomberos from the diaspora, from New York, and it started presenting in one single album multiple styles of bomba. So it brought together a Mayagüez style, Catania style, Loisa style, Santurce style in one album, and that wasn't very common before. Um, and it was from New York, which is really great. So I think in terms of understanding what these traditions are, being based on a foundation and being something that is netamente uh, Puerto Ricano, right? Patriarca de la Bomba. But also seeing how it can thrive and grow in the diaspora because home is, is not specific to a geography, right? Well, I want to thank you both. It's been an honor and a privilege to be with a legend and I would say oh, a future please. legend, if not one already. I mean, you guys are really uh, treasures for our community. And uh, yeah, muchas gracias. Don't okay. tell me we're finished. <laughs> uh, we're yeah. finished. <laughs> 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 yeah. Muchísimas gracias.